Good evening. Thanks for tuning in to our Bible study of the book of Matthew here with Curtis and Nick. And we are digging into the, the sacred text, trying to unearth, you know, the inspired author's purpose of this book and what we've kind of concluded as we've gone through this book, that it's to prove to the Jews that Jesus is the promised Messiah and to answer the question, maybe as the, us as readers have, of why did people reject him? And week after week, we're kind of seeing the answers to those questions. We're picking up in chapter 22 tonight, if you're following along, and we encourage you to do so. But we're at the culmination of Jesus' ministry. He's heading toward the cross. He's been in Jerusalem. He cleansed the temple there and performed some different miracles. And now he's been speaking in parables. Nick or Curtis, anything we want to bring up as we introduce this section tonight? I think that tonight we're going to start uh, here in chapter 22 by seeing this third parable. And these parables are all designed to convict the Jewish leaders uh, mm-hmm. uh, of some different aspects. So we saw the parable of the two sons, we saw the parable of the tenants, and then tonight we're going to see the parable of that wedding feast. What was the ultimate sin of these Jewish leaders? Come on, I'm quoting you on it. You said the end of the lesson last week. <laughs> they, 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 they were not producing fruit. Yeah, leafy and not fruity, right? Yeah. So, it goes back to 520 that uh, in Sermon on the Mount, Jesus calls us to a higher degree of righteousness. All these, all these parables too are illustrating the same idea. Mm-hmm. You know, they're back to back ideas of here's what you're doing wrong. If you don't get this one, here you get this one. Uh, and the one we're going to talk about, one of the ones we're going to talk about tonight, uh, is the same idea. Um, it's back to back to back, just illustrating different points. Yeah, and God wants you in yeah. the kingdom, but there's requirements yeah. to there's, being in the kingdom. There's, yeah, yeah, there's, there's basically requir- what it is. There's requirements, and they aren't your standards. They're the st- all of them point to. We follow the standards of the master, not the standards oh, of yeah, the master. Oh, yeah, very good. The master yeah. determines what is good fruit, yeah, not us. Exactly. Yeah. And so, so the, again, the contrast to the Pharisees, the ones being, you know, like we would see in the Sermon on the Mount, determining what is, what is good looking to the people rather than um, what is good looking to God and what God expects of us rather than what man. Okay, kind of similar even to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, where many were saying to me, Lord, Lord, did we do all these things in your name? And that's not the works that the yeah, Father wanted them to absolutely. do. Yeah, I right. never knew you. Very good. So let's pick up chapter 22 in verse 1. It says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to. To come, which right off the bat is, you don't do that in that society, right? Yeah. I mean, the wedding feast is a big deal. It went on for days. You know, people, uh, I like to run home and get out of going to weddings and things like that and go home and watch TV or read a book or something. But this is what you did. This is where you went. This is the center of, of social interaction. So this king gave a wedding for his son and he sent out his slave to call a bunch of people, but they were unwilling to come. And now as we read through this, remember, this is the kingdom of heaven is being compared to this. So God's kingdom is being compared to this feast. And then he says, again, he sent out other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat and livestock are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, each one to his own farm and another to his business. And the rest um, seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. So now there's a lot of similarities here to a previous parable we just read in in chapter 21. Well, what do you guys see here? Uh, I just think it's important to to see that, again, similar back to this parable of the tenants, that there's there's preparation put in. Mm -hmm. This wasn't just a willy-nilly, oh, hey, it's Friday tomorrow. I'm going to go ahead and and build this wedding feast. There was a a lot of preparation, a lot of effort. Preordained plan. And and, yeah, yeah, and it was communicated ahead of time as well. Um, And so they knew that that wedding... A wedding feast was coming um, and that they should have been expecting it being prepared. For so they all. knew it was coming. They should have been ready. They, the expectation was there. Right. Yeah. So then again, a comparison to where we would place the religious leaders, mm-hmm. right? The religious leaders being at the top scene, the Messiah is here. We should go and follow him. Instead, they're like, eh. Yeah. And this is exactly what these guests are doing. Yeah. Well, and if, if Jesus is ushering in the kingdom here, yeah. this is huge because... The kingdom has been prepared, it has been planned, and now the invitation is coming, and they're not willing to come. Yeah, we see three three different reactions. They either ignore it, um, or they made excuses, um, or they uh, react violently and attack the servants. Yeah. Well, see, when Nick was dating Cheyenne, I was telling him for years, Nick, you need to hurry up and marry this girl. 
Which was good advice, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. See, it was good advice. Hurry up and marry her, hurry up and marry her. So, so we were expecting him to hurry up and propose. We wanted him to hurry up and propose. We were excited, you know, that they're going to get married. And if he finally did that, which he did, and then invited everybody to come to the wedding and everybody said, oh, no, I, I'm not, I'm not coming. That'd be kind of weird, right? <laughs> kind of rude. Although I, I didn't come, but. <laughs> <laughs> Rude. I think I was busy, but um, you did send me several books. Though. Yeah, see, I did get a gift at least. You made so. up for it. I made up for it. But, <laughs> buying me gifts. <laughs> um, so there's an invitation here to this wedding, and they sent out people to invite. And then also notice verse four. He, he's almost like bribing them. I've done all of this. Look at all these blessings. Look at what you will receive. It's gonna be so good. It's gonna I got be so the beef. great. Yeah, I got the beef. Says the Harris Ranch guy. But I mean, <laughs> think about this. And you think about from a historical standpoint, just like the parable of the landowner here, God sent out prophets. Yeah. He told them it's going to be amazing. The kingdom is coming. The prophets come. And then Jesus comes, and yet they don't come to the wedding. And there's a problem here. And then, in fact, verse 6, it's more than that. It's not just that they declined the invitation. What do they do in verse 6? They seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. So it's not just to send back a, 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 my regards, I can't make it. It's, right. no, I don't even want to be invited. How dare you tell me I reject Stop this. Right, we're sending you a message yeah. about the way we feel about this feast. I like how cursory you, but they send a message of it, and curse says, stop bothering me. Yeah. And it's, and the Jewish leaders were bothered by it. How dare you keep telling me? Right. I mean, they didn't like John the Baptist, right? They didn't like all these other people telling them, repent, the kingdom is at hand. Well, I mean, yeah. even before that, too, you know, look what they did to prophets and yeah. people who came in the name of God. I mean, we saw that in the last parable, mm -hmm. you know? The wine grower. So the the king invites everybody. God invites everybody to his kingdom. And people don't listen. And in fact, they kill the messengers, which they did in the Old Testament, which is a common theme of Jesus' parables and even in the sermons and acts about how people rejected and, God's message. And they message. should have predicted, right, that every almost every time, over almost every imprint, in, in illustration we see within the Old Testament, when a prophet comes to preach to the people, there's always some type of persecution, if yeah. not death. Almost every time. It's almost universal across the entire story. And so there's never a happy ending for a prophet. So what they should have expected the Messiah of the Messiah is that he was coming to, you know, as we, we might point out, do what Jonah did in Nineveh. Come and preach to the people so that they would repent. Yeah. And... The people didn't like that. They didn't like it. Um, it was a, almost like a role reversal as where, you know, no, Jonah was not happy that the people repented, and, but Jesus is wanting people to he repent. He wants them to repent, uh, and yet they reject so, him. Yeah, so the reject, yeah. Well, then, so the king is enraged, and rightly so, because he's given this opportunity for everybody to partake of this great feast. And the king is enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and sent their city on fire. So he invited them, they rejected him, he sent their slaves, and they killed the slaves. So now he's angry, which, by the way, when the king invites you to, let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> when the king invites you, you go. You don't get a choice to say no, usually, right. I wouldn't think. And so the king is now mad, and he sends his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. So we have punishment upon those who reject the invitation to the kingdom. At least that's what I see. Do you guys see anything different here? No, and that's what I, we're, we're going to see what I think is an escalation with these three parables, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so the first one, the parable of the two sons, was merely to acknowledge that one didn't do what they were supposed to do. And then the parable of the tenants was that the kingdom of God will be taken away from those who mm -hmm. are not producing fruit. And here we see in two instances um, that they are, they are killed, and then ultimately burned or, or cast yeah. out into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so the the seriousness is being elevated where, where, or highlighted rather, um, that this is a, a serious infraction. Oh, absolutely. Oh, this isn't that bad. Oh, yeah, it's bad. It's going to um, resort into yeah. king sending armies at you. Do you have a theory on maybe what he's talking about specifically in verse um, in verse 7? Well, we're going to see, what was it, in chapter 23, 24? Yes. Um, a call to the, the end of the age. Um, is it an allusion to the destruction of Jerusalem? I think there might be hints there. I'm not going to hang my hat on it because the text, we can overthink parables sometimes. Yeah, you know, the ultimate point of this parable is to say there's people that rejected the invitation. Yeah. That's the point of it. So to look at all the intricacies, no, but I do kind of think, well, man, he is going to 
tear out the temple system and the Jerusalem's going to be gone and Jewish system by a whole is going to be taken out. Maybe this is an allusion to that. Or it might just be, look, you guys are going to get punished. Can, can I also point out to you that, that uh, this clearly shows the exercise of free will that the subjects have oh, yeah. the king. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that they aren't forced to go. You know, we aren't forced to abide by kingdom rules. No human is told they have to be a Christian. Um, and the king will never enforce that upon us. That has to be a willing thing that we do. That has to be from our heart. But um, there's only one right choice. Right. There's only one I right like choice, that though, right? right? So you, you got to look at it from that standpoint too, is that, you know, there, there's a free, God doesn't force us to do anything. Mm-hmm. We have free will. Yeah. Um, you can choose sin. You can choose righteousness. You can choose anything you want, but it's your choice. And there's only one good choice. Yeah. Well, and then, to piggyback off of that is just look at the desire uh, of the king in this instance, right? right? He, he wanted them mm-hmm. to come. He, he invited them. Yes. And then he sent his servants to remind them that, hey, right. it's right here. And then he sent his servants again. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's not just this passive thing. He's actively searching. You, right. you mentioned a, a couple weeks ago on the, your, uh, the talk Sunday night about the prodigal son mm-hmm. and how the father standing there waiting for the son to come back. And I mean, we kind of see that this king invited people to the party. He's right. standing there waiting for them to come, wanting mm-hmm. them to come so bad that right. he sent his servants out multiple times. Yeah, he, he's every opportunity is being provided for them to come. But what happens is they reject him, so they're punished for it. Verse 8, Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. So now they go out to everywhere, and it's not just to the invited guests, but to the general populace, and brings them in. To the Jew first and then to the Greek. And I think that's what he's yeah, doing that's here, exactly yeah. exactly what he's doing. Yeah. And so I, I just think that those who were not worthy, they were not worthy because they rejected the invitation, right? There, there's, uh, there's nothing more to that, is there? Well, I, yeah, I, 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 we're going to talk more about not worthy here maybe in a second, but I think this parallels just like these two sons. One says, I will, but doesn't go. Another says, I won't, but will. And these are like the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Those are the ones coming. Mm-hmm. But it mentions evil and good, too, right. are being invited in. And maybe it's kind of like the final separation we talk about. And you're, you know, as you talked about the parable of the tares way yeah, back right. when, well, too. We talked about just in a previous again. chapter, yeah. you know, where tax collectors and prostitutes will inherit the kingdom yeah. of God. So, I mean... Um, well, well, notice what happens in verse 11, because now we get this other problem that happens. So everybody's invited. Well, the original invitees reject him and they're punished for it. Probably the Jewish leaders, Jews and that kind of stuff, rejecting Jesus. Now everyone is invited to come. And what happens is in verse 11, but when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, so he looks at it, all the people that are said to be part of the end of the kingdom now. He looked over the dinner guests and he saw a man who was not dressed in wedding clothes. Now, I, I did a little bit of digging on this, and maybe you guys did too, but from what I understand is that there was formal attire provided at the door kind of almost for this. Um, you know, maybe like it's a, a, a restaurant that requires a jacket, so they have a room full of jackets there, which I've never been to a restaurant like that Curtis probably has, but I've never been to a restaurant that required a jacket. Um, Taco Bell does not have a dress code that lets you go know pretty much wearing anything. <laughs> no shoes, no shirt. Yeah, but... Um, so now you have a person who came to the wedding, and he's not wearing the wedding clothes. Well, but but if that's the case, and I think that that is probably one of those times where we we miss the cultural uh, yeah. callbacks, or, or because we, we look at this with from a Western perspective, uh, from an American perspective, to where it verse twelve doesn't make sense. It doesn't. Why, why is he mad that he's not dressed right for the wedding? What what does that have? Yeah, to he's do? not the groom. He's not the bride. What's but, the deal? But if if that's the case, and I think it is that. That, that completely changes the way that I, I look at this yeah. because now it's, it's that this person got in from a different way. Yeah, I see it almost like this person was invited in and they want the blessings of being there but not the requirements. Ooh. You know what I mean? They want they don't want to bear the actual fruit of it. So I, they came in, oh yeah, I want to come in. I want the feast. I want to be part of the wedding. But don't ask me to do anything. Don't ask me to change. You know what I mean? Them, change my attire, them. right? That kind of thing. Yeah. Let's uh, go ahead. Well, and I was thinking it's almost, and maybe I'm making a big illusion with this, but it's like, I want to come in, but I don't want to be clothed in righteousness. I want to have the blessings of a relationship with Jesus, but I don't want to be clothed in Christ. Yeah. I want to come in and do what I want, not what you want me to do, King. 
And if you think about the whole idea of bearing fruit in this whole passage, the lack of wedding clothes shows this person is not a fruit bearer. At least that's what I see. I don't know if you guys have a different way of looking at it. No, I, I agree. And I, I like the, the call to the being clothed with Christ. Uh, yeah. I mean, I even wrote that down in my notes here. Um, that it's, it's obvious. It's apparent when we are clothed with Christ and when we're not. And I think I'm, I'm a fruity fan. Um, and I think that our fruits will indicate the clothing that we wear. Well, when the parable of the sower, when the sower went out to sow, some of it went with people that grew up really quick, but because they had no root, you know, they withered and died. I think that's this person here. They come in ready to have the wedding feast, but they don't want the responsibility. They don't want to wear their clothing. They don't want to, they just don't want to do what's expected of them. There's expectations for citizens of the kingdom. There's expectations yeah. on me and you guys. And right. if we don't fulfill those expectations. And you have to be, you know, when you accept that invitation, you have to be willing to accept the terms and conditions, mm-hmm. so to speak. Of yeah, that, no, we do. Of that, you know, if I'm going to be invited, if I'm invited to a, a wedding of some kind and they say formal dress code, well, I better be in formal dress or I'm not going to be welcome at that wedding. Yeah. Um, there's requirements for me to participate in that activity. Uh, I think I'm probably just repeating what no, you but, said. I mean, <laughs> or even if you hire, you hire somebody to work a job, yeah. they come to get a paycheck, but there's an expectation. Okay, you um, black shirt, black pants, black shoes are required to work at Carl's Jr. Right. You know what I mean? What happens if you, if you don't wear those things? Then you don't get a paycheck. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what it is, right? Yeah. Same idea. Yeah. Well, then the, the king comes to the man and he says, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? What's the deal with this? And the man was speechless. He was he was surprised that the king reacted this way. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just it's got, he's caught off guard. He didn't expect to be identified or called out. Yeah, I didn't expect that to be held responsible for. Right, his there's actions. so many people in here. I won't be noticed if I'm not doing this thing. Yeah, right. Like like a uh, you know like to the human eye, if there was a large group of people and we expected in unison people to do one thing, one particular thing. If somebody had one shoe that was a slightly different color than what was required, it's a good chance that we wouldn't notice something like that. Yeah. But and I think that that's kind of where this point drives home is that he he wasn't expecting to be noticed. He thought he could get away with it. Maybe. He thought he could, yeah. And the cool thing is, I mean, and this might be another instance where we're digging a little too deep into the parables, but but look at what was expected of him. Look at what was right. required. It was required to wear the wedding garment. It was required to be clothed with Christ. That right. is the requirement. That is the expectation. And oftentimes I don't want that to be the expectation, so I right. avoid that. But it was and a universal was expectation for everyone and every guest. For the sure. bad and the yeah, good. Yeah, just like the, the one about the workers in the vineyard that worked at different times. The expectation was just work. You know what I mean? Not in that kind of stuff, and you get the same reward. I one time, year, years ago, studied with a lady, a baptizer under Christ, and we were actually studying through the book of Matthew, um, actually. And I remember she made a statement. Again, she she actually left the faith, and her statement was, there's just kind of, there's too many rules, too much stuff required of me in this. She wanted the blessing of being a Christian, but didn't want the responsibility. I pray she comes back and makes that change, but I kind of see that here. The wedding clothes, not willing to wear the garment. Well, the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. There's exclusivity to following Jesus. There's requirements. There's expectations. And if you don't fulfill them, you will be punished. I just think it's, I mean, there's so much here, but it's cool because for many are called. All are invited, right? And so that first round of invitations was selected, but the second round went to Everybody, Everyone. the bad and the good. And all we have to do is say, yeah, I'm good. I'm coming to the wedding. But those that kind of come to the wedding, but without following through with their commitment, it's bad. It's outer darkness. This is hell type terminology, weeping, gnashing of teeth. I mean, it's almost, this may be a bad analogy, but it's almost like when you were a kid and you, your parents bought a bag of trail mix and you went in and picked at all the M&Ms, you know. Or the things that you wanted yeah, yeah. in there, the things that were good, um, and then you left what was bad. Uh, and so, I, I mean, don't I guess be the, the almonds. I, no, I mean, don't <laughs> be the almonds. But I, I guess the point I'm trying to illustrate is that's the, when I when I read that I was thinking to myself, you know, he, had, you know, you invited everybody, right? Mm-hmm. But not everybody's going to follow what's required of that 
particular setting. Not everyone's going to meet the guidelines. Yeah. Not. I don't want that to sound weird. No, but it is. And, and I, I know you're, you're trying to shy away from signs that, well, there's a checklist <laughs> and all this. But there is requirements of being and, a citizen of the right, kingdom. And, I'm not and if you don't to, follow the king, you're going to be judged. They're not right, burdensome and I, requirements. No. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. I'm not trying to make this sound like, you know, predestination or anything. But but you have to – there is an obligation you have when you accept an invitation, right? Yeah. So that's the way I look at if it. If you don't show up with the wedding clothes on, you're not wouldn't, chosen to partake in the feel feast. Bad? Wouldn't you feel bad if you showed up to something, there was a requirement, and you didn't do that requirement? Wouldn't you feel guilty? Wouldn't you feel you some be. kind of shame or or – Guilt. That's why you know when I look at that, the man was speechless. Yeah, I would be speechless too. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, and, uh, and, and, but I had back, every reason there, to there's, know. There's so right? many callbacks, and you just mentioned uh, chapter seven, Sermon on the Mount. Mm-hmm. On that day, many will come to me and say, "Did we not do this, this, or this?" Yep. And I will say, "What?" I will catch them off guard. Right. They will mm-hmm. be speechless when I tell them. Why to do you call me, me Lord, Lord, and do not? And we're going to I see say. that again in, in 25. And, and this is throughout Matthew. We see these very serious. Warnings. Yep, sure. Yeah. And, and we see it here with this contrast between the people who are wearing the wedding garments and the ones who aren't. Mm-hmm. Um, in that place, there's in outer darkness. In that place, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. We right. see that in the parable of the tares, mm-hmm. right. that exact same language. And, and there, there's a contrast between the wheat and the weeds. Uh, mm-hmm. We see it with the fishnet. Um, yep. There's a contrast between the good fish and the bad fish. We're going to see it again with the parable of the two servants. Right. The wicked servant is told the same thing. And then finally, in the parable of the talents. The one talent servant is told the same thing. There's a direct contrast. And in all these contrasts, there are the people who produce fruits and the ones that don't. I think that this is one that I I hadn't noticed before this study and one that is a serious reminder. And once you see how it fits to the whole, it definitely flows with the the train of thought. Well, we're going to go into the next section here. and, and, And for our listeners and viewers, you know, at home, I feel bad a little bit because verse 15 through 22 kind of ties into maybe the next section better, but uh, we'll cover a little bit more material, but we'll hit it again. But now we get into a a section of Matthew where different individuals or groups are trying to test Jesus and trap him. They don't like what he has to say, which probably a response to these parables. He's ticked everybody off now. They're mad and they want to get him. I mean, we saw that at the end of 21, that the yeah. Pharisees, they, they figured out that, hey, wait, 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 you're speaking about me, right? Well, yeah, and if, yeah, you're, you're right. He's still been, this whole, this whole section is a rebuke of the Pharisees yeah. primarily. So now they're upset. So verse 15, the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him and what he said, which you think they would have learned that never works, but they want to trap him again <laughs> in what he said. And they sent their disciples, the other people have disciples too, mm-hmm. along with the Herodians. Now, who are the Herodians? They're the Jews that accepted Rome, right? Well, at least Herod's rule and had allegiance to yeah, Herod, which most people didn't like Herod because all the Herods were bad people. And the, the Pharisees and Herodians so wouldn't normally... The Jews is what yeah. we might call them. But the Pharisees weren't like that. No, no, no. So why are they no, getting along? Hardcore. Uh, well, they have something in common. Yeah, they right? both hate Jesus. Yeah, they both hate yeah. Jesus, right? <laughs> Jesus unites people. <laughs> right. And go, we'll see next week that the Sadducees were part of this group too, or at least mm-hmm. they, they came in with a one-two punch. Right. He's to. this, and like we've mentioned before, he's turning everything they think they know on its head. And he's turning uniting all these out. different groups and against he's him. He's bringing all these people together, going, "We need to get rid of this guy," you know, because he's causing lots of problems. But he's also uniting a lot of but uh, that's groups for him. Yeah, too. very uh-huh. true. So they, along with the Herodians, came to him. So here's their big test. Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the word of God in truth and defer to no one, for you are not partial in any way. Okay, first off, I may, maybe I'm <laughs> sensing tone in English, but knowing the Pharisees and the Herodians, they don't believe that about Jesus for they're, one second. They're lying. They're, they're lying. They're trying, they're trying to, to, yeah. But you know, or yeah, they're trapped. Like we know hey, you're not going to lie. Hey, Gee, we you want never... you to you know, yeah. feel good before you before we ask you this question. So then they ask. Here's their big. Here's what they come up with. With the the melding of all the minds here. What do can we come up with? Tell us then. What do you think? Is it lawful to give poll tax to Caesar or not? Now, why would that be a question designed to trap him? Look at who's with them. Oh, it's it's going to pit. They're attempting to pit Jesus against the the governing authority. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why, I mean, if you remember back what we talked about last week, that when people come to him, 
uh, during the day. They're putting on this show, right? The question wasn't necessarily for Jesus. The question and the way they worded it was for all the other people around. So you have those that are saying, yeah, absolutely, you better pay taxes because that's the law. And then you got others, like if I had talked to you about tax code, you would say all taxation is theft, well, right? So exactly. that, that's what the Jews would say about this. This is all theft. The Romans have no right to take yeah. our money. And they're, they're, they're wanting to pit him against Jewish culture yeah. by saying that if he agrees to pay taxes... He is not a Jew like us. But if he doesn't, he's rejecting the law, which makes him a law breaker. Exactly. Well, yeah. they they considered the tax collectors traitors. Yeah. Because they were they were Jewish men. Typically, that's what we see when we mean by tax collectors: a Jewish man who's worked for the Roman government. That's why you have zealots who are killing tax collectors. And so there's no uh, people who were pledging their allegiance to the Roman government, who whom the Jews believed they were enslaved, you know, in, in exile. From God until the time in which this Messiah would come and free them. That's what they believed. And so when they're asking this question, is it lawful, you know, for a Jew to, what they, what they're wanting is justification for what they're not doing. But if the Herodians are there too, they can't get say, so, I mean, he's well, basically, Herodians pay taxes. Yeah, come on. he can't, he can't <laughs> say it either way. There's no easy way here. So Jesus perceived their malice. He knows why they're doing this. And he says, why are you testing me? You hypocrites. Because that's what they are. They're two-faced. They're faking it. Yeah. And then he says, show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? So he holds up a coin and says, who's on it? And they said, Caesar's. And he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Since the money has his face on it, give him it. It's not ours anyway. Who cares? He's not saying that taxes are good. He's not saying that taxes are bad. He just says, look, it's his money anyway. Give it to him and give the things that are God, God, to God. And hearing this, they were amazed and leaving him, they went away. The gut punch passage. So, but yeah, it, <laughs> it, it's cool though, because the, the Pharisees, I mean, th- this isn't the last attack on them. We're going to see one again or two before the chapter's over. Um, but they're constantly amazed. It's like that. Oh my goodness, he stumped us again. He, he got this. And that's what, I mean, if we just go through here and look at all the they's or theirs, verse 22 is just amazing. When they, the disciples of the Pharisees, heard it, they marveled and then they left away. Yeah. And, and so they were still marveled at Jesus' teaching. And we can be marveled at Jesus' teaching, but it doesn't matter yeah. if we are continuing to have that hard heart and are not allowing it to change us. We can be wowed by it. And be, wow, Jesus is a powerful teacher. But if we still don't bear fruit, we're... Going to be punished for it. Very good. I mean, I love I love the question he asked. Whose likeness and inscription is this? And mm-hmm. then directly after that, he says, and it's almost like he's making a comparison to the question that they ask in humanity, saying, if you're made in the likeness of God, in the image of God, right? This coin is has Caesar's image on it. The idea that give to Caesar what is Caesar's and the things to God that are God's. Mm-hmm. I think that's a powerful, oh, powerful way to Very look good. at it, that you belong to God. Like and li- literally right after this in 2230, he's going to say, he's going to mention this phrase that's repeated all throughout the old law, right? To love the mm-hmm. Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, soul, and strength. So don't worry about all these other things. You just commit yeah. yourself to God. Right. I like exactly. it. Yeah. I, I hope he also flipped the coin back at him and walked out. I just, in my <laughs> mind, that's what I picture it. He goes, then whose is it? Boom. And walks off. Cause totally that, that oh, you have to handle that situation. <laughs> but they were amazed and they left him, well, they left him temporarily cause they come back later to bother him again. Yeah. And they went away. Yeah. The, it, that's what the Sadducees come up. And so it's like the Pharisees had their shot. Well, we're going to go up and one up them right. and. Pharisees well, come back with lawyers. The, and, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and whenever the lawyers get involved, yeah, it's all, it's all bad. From there. Well, we'll stop right there tonight, but a huge parable about the marriage feast, which I think tells us that God wants all to come to the kingdom, but you need to come with the expectation there's responsibilities placed upon you. And then we looked at this question that was asked, and the answer was, devote yourself to God, and Jesus is able to shoot down these questions designed to trap, because no one can trap Jesus. Um, I appreciate everybody tuning in tonight. Do you guys have anything you want to add before we close out? No. Okay, well, um, remember our Zoom class on Wednesday night. Also, we are taking up collection for the Manulito Navajo Children's Home. We've already collected a lot of funds, but I'd love us to be able to send gift cards to all the kids. There's 21 kids um, there right now living there, but be able to send all the kids gift cards for Christmas and then send funds to each one of the households that support them for household you know, needs and upkeep, and it's a big operation there. So if you want to donate to that, see me, come out of the church office or talk to one of the leaders here. We'll get you plugged in with that. 
You have till December 1st to donate to that work and keep an eye out for opportunities to do good and to let your light shine. Let's be people that, that aren't show and no go. We want to be people that are fruity and not leafy, right? So on that thought, have a good evening.